All right, after a little bit of a break, I'm finally back with another review. Today we're going to be looking at the eighth book in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, Blood and Gold. I've got to say, I was definitely losing steam a little bit with the Vampire Chronicles series. Although I did quite like Merrick, I wasn't that much of a fan of the Tales of the New Vampires, and so I was wondering maybe if I would end up giving up on the series, but with Blood and Gold, my faith in the series have been restored, and I'm really looking forward to talking about this one. Blood and Gold might just be in my top three Vampire Chronicles books so far. Part 1, Summary. In Blood and Gold, Marius de Romanus, the 2,000-year-old vampire, finally relates his long history. His story begins with his vampiric origins in ancient Rome as part of a druidic order who seek to imprison him inside a tree as their god of the grove. But the story primarily focuses on Marius' long tenure as the guardian of the vampire king and queen Enkil and Akasha, who sit like silent stones as he loyally protects them over the centuries. Throughout this, many familiar and many new characters meet Marius along the way. We learn more about his failed relationships with Pandora, the tragic loss of Armand, and we also get insights into his relationships with minor characters from previous books like Bianca, a young woman who Marius knew along with Armand in the Renaissance. Once again, Rice uses her characters to explore themes in history, religion and culture, with a big focus this time on Renaissance art. Part 2. Getting it together. If you've watched my reviews of the Tales of the New Vampires, then you'll know that one of my main criticisms of those books is that while I do think they do very interesting experiments with the historical novel format that Rice really loves, I think ultimately these experiments fail because Rice spends too much time focusing on the history and not enough time focusing on the characters and the plot and the story. So it almost feels like the vampires are an excuse for Rice to just tell us, you know, about what she's learned from history lately, rather than a story with a historical backdrop. But that really isn't the case with Blood and Gold. I think by this point, Rice has really perfected her ability to combine her interest in history and culture and all the rest with her vampires. And so you get a very integrated novel this time. Even though this story is substantially longer than both of the tale of the new vampires, it didn't really drag for me at all. Even when Rice was taking digressions to talk about culture and art and Botticelli, I actually found those bits really engaging and interesting because they made sense with respect to Marius and his character development. It made sense that he would be interested in that culture, and so it didn't really feel like a digression. It just felt like a natural thing that Marius would be interested in given that he was alive in that time. Whereas I didn't feel like that was the case in the other books. Rice spends a lot of time building up Marius's character so that we have a real understanding of who he is and why he's interested in culture. He's interested in it because he likes to be around humans even though he is a vampire and therefore necessarily outside of humanity. But he likes culture because it's his way in, it's his only way really of connecting to human beings. So it makes sense that he would be really passionate about art and that's why he wants to engage in it. And it's this logical connection between the character and the culture and the historical stuff that makes this novel really interesting. And finally, I think, is a case of Rice getting that balance right between these various things. Part 3. Marius and his relationships. So Marius is a very interesting character in that he's been around since, I think, the vampire start, and he's always been a background character in that he's not like one of the main ones, but he's always had a very interesting role in the story. He guarded Akasha and Enkil for centuries, and so he's very important to the story, but we don't really know all that much about him. Even though he appears quite prominently in The Vampire Armand, he's still quite a mysterious figure. And there was a worry that I had going into this that Rice would kind of not, you know, capitalise on that mystery. Because I felt like in the case of Pandora, for example, who is another character who has a lot of mystery around her, Rice just didn't do enough in that book on Pandora to really bring the character to life. But I feel like with Marius and this book, she really did do that. She really did make Marius into more than just this mysterious secondary character. She brought him to life, she made him sympathetic, and she gave him very interesting relationships. Not just with the vampires that we're familiar with, but with other vampires, new and also background characters from previous books. I really liked how he developed the relationship between Marius and Pandora. One of my criticisms of Pandora was that in that book, we don't really spend that much time on their relationship and we don't really understand why it fell apart. And in this book, one of the kind of main arcs that Marius has is the fallout of his relationship with Pandora. Even though their actual time together is quite short in the book, she lives on in his memory consistently throughout the book. And his whole character and his tragedy and everything about him is kind of based on him feeling bad for leaving her and wanting to make amends. And you really feel that consistently in his character throughout the whole story. 
Another relationship that I really liked that was developed was Marius' relationship to Armand. It would have been quite easy for Rice to have glossed over this relationship because it was already substantially covered in the Vampire Armand, so she might have felt like, well, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's retreading old ground. But actually, a big bulk of the story is set in this time period and focuses on their relationship. And I thought that this was a really good decision because in other books where Rice has retreaded old ground, she does gloss over things and you just lose a lot of insight into, you know, how would this character react differently from the character who's told the story before? But in this book, she doesn't do that. We get a lot of time spent on this relationship and we get repeats of events that we've already seen in previous books. But there's enough difference in how Marius perceives these events from the previous characters for it to still be very interesting and engaging. And in fact, I almost want to go back now and read The Vampire Armand and read Pandora just to see if I can appreciate those books a little bit more having had it seen from this perspective, because I think that would be quite interesting to actually know more concretely what the differences are. The final thing that I really liked in terms of Marius and his relationships was his relationship with Bianca. Bianca was a minor character from the Vampire Armand who was interesting, but I think she wasn't all that well developed in the book. She was just kind of, not kind of just there, she was one of the standout characters, but still didn't have that, you know, three-dimensional quality that I really like in a character. But in this book, she really takes on that and her relationship with Marius is just fantastic. And for me, one of the highlights of the book is where their relationship goes, because I just think it's, I, I don't really want to spoil, so I won't really say where it goes, but it goes to some very interesting places. It was also nice that Rice did bring back that character, because it felt like her character in The Vampire Armand was unresolved and sidelined. And Rice sometimes does do this with characters. She can just throw them under the bus, like she does with Gabrielle, and we never see them again. So it was nice that she brought Bianca back and she actually explored her character a bit more. And I'm really hoping she comes back in future books as well. So overall then, just some great character moments and great relationships in this story. And this was something that, like I said, I felt was lacking in previous books, which was just focusing on that history stuff. In this book though, Rice pulls back that stuff a little bit. She focuses more on the characters and their relationships and the story is all the better for it. Part four, vampires, religion and art. So like always, Rice is going to spend her books philosophizing about the nature of history, art, religion and all this stuff, and Blood and Gold is no different. But what is different is what she chooses to focus on this time, and I found that to be very interesting when I was reading it. A big part of the book is Marius seeing Renaissance art, and in particular the work of Botticelli, and becoming obsessed by it. And what he's particularly interested by is the ways in which this art, although it uses Christian imagery, injects a certain kind of paganism, primitivism into it. And this is something that Marius is really drawn to. And he explicitly says that he doesn't really like the medieval religious painting, which is very constrained and, you know, kind of held back almost. Whereas the Renaissance art, he thinks, is injected more with humanity, or at least the, you know, more primitive sides of humanity than the more puritanical religious art that was around previously. This interested me because I know that Rice had a very complicated time with religion throughout her life and at various parts in her life she changed her views on it. And one thing that she seems to have been consistently against is organised religion, but she still seems to always have maintained a certain amount of faith in some capacity, whether that's in a personal god or in the supernatural more generally. And you sort of see that reflected in this story because she likes, or Marius, who she's writing about, likes religious art, but only in the context of paganism, not when it's constrained too much by religious puritanical impulses, because then it doesn't really reflect true humanity, or at least that's what it seems to Marius in the book. So I found that really interesting and it's something that I just really stood out to me as I was reading it. And I think at some point when I've read the whole books, I'm gonna to have to go through and have a look at how Rice's relationship to religion is reflected in the various books. Because I think every time she just focuses on something slightly different and I just find that fascinating. Another thing that I noticed as well to do with art and Marius's character is that he seems to be very interested in art and he paints a lot, but it's often pointed out by Marius himself that he can never live up to the, you know, the great masters like Botticelli. He's a good painter and people are in awe of the work that he does, but he doesn't think it ever kind of matches the heights of, you know, the great artists of the time period. And I found, again, I found this kind of interesting and wondered if this was Rice kind of commenting on the nature of being a vampire and the thought that being an immortal kind of puts you outside of humanity a little bit. You know, you don't have to worry about death. You will go on forever. And so in some sense, that detachment means that your art is more, you know, it might be very skillful. It might be, you know, display a lot of talent, 
But in terms of like passion and drive, these things seem to come maybe from like a mortal person. And an immortal just can't really tap into that, even though Marius is very attracted to it because he can't have that as a vampire. So I found that to be very interesting and is another example of how Rice always tries to think in her work, you know, what would it actually be like to be a vampire? And how would that affect not just your relationship to yourself and how you don't age over time, but also your relationship to the world that changes around you as, you know, times move, people die. And in this case, it, how it might change your relationship to art as well. Again, just a great bit about the book and another example of how she's integrating the stuff that she wants to say about art really well with her characters like Marius. Definitely let me know what you think about this kind of stuff in the comments because I think it's one of the best parts of Rice's books, especially when she integrates it well like she does here. Part 5. Tying it all together. So as one of the longest lived vampires, he's been involved in the lives of all of the main vampires who we've had stories from, I think for the most part, and in a way it seems to me like in this book Rice is using this as a kind of way to just capitulate everything that's gone on in all the previous books to tie everything together and bring it all together back to the present day. And I think she does a really good job in this book of doing that. For a long time now, the Vampire Chronicles have very much focused on you have a little bit in the present day and the, the, then the, you know, the vampire who we're following tells their history, which intertwines with Louis' story and the start stories and all that stuff. And then we get back to the present day, but it's rare that the stories really move forward you might get a slight progression at the end. Like in this book, we get a slight progression at the end, which I won't uh, spoil, but it doesn't really move forward in time all that much, you know. This usually takes place over the course of one night. And that's fine, but I think at this point, it's getting to the point where if she kept doing this sort of going back and stopping and going back and stopping, there wouldn't be that much left to tell because she's kind of told the stories of all the main players by this point. And I think, as far as I know anyway, the books that follow this do focus more on developing into the future rather than focusing as much on the past. And so if that's the case, it really, f so if that's the case, then I would say that Blood and Gold is almost like a greatest hits of the first half of the Vampire Chronicles. It's got all of the characters there. It's got another point of view on all of those key moments from the history that we're quite familiar with up until this point. And hopefully it's setting the scene for things to change in the future books when we're looking more towards the present day and the future. That isn't to say that this book is just, you know, a rehash of things because even though, like I've said before, there are rehashes, there are things that you will have read about before, Rice does give you enough to make it interesting. First of all, because Marius just comes from a very interesting perspective. He's someone who's been around for much longer than all the other vampires. He's lived a very detached life, you know, serving the king and queen. And so there is just a very different spin on all of the main events up until this point. And to be honest, I would say that of all the narrators, Marius might be the one that's the most honest or objective. I feel like with the other ones, they always seem a lot more emotionally invested in clearing their names. And, you know, Lestat wants to not be seen as the villain that Louis makes him out to be. And our man seems to want to be made out to be uh, not the villain that Lestat and Louis make him out to be. I don't know why I think this, but I feel like Marius just comes across as a lot more sincere and authentic. Probably because he's been around for so long, he just doesn't see the point of telling lies anyway. Let me know what you think about that though. Do you think that Marius is the most reliable narrator that we've had so far? Or do you think that he's a bit dodgy like the rest of them? But in any case, I do think this book is a great capitulation of all the previous books, but still managing to find new things to say and new ideas to talk about as well. Part six, conclusion. Overall, I think that Blood and Gold is a fantastic book and it's definitely in the top three for me at the moment anyway. Rice manages to successfully combine her love of history, culture and art with her vampires for the first time in, I would say, a few books. So it was really good that she managed to pull it all together for this one. She even manages to bring background characters like Bianca and Santino from previous books and put them to the fore and give them a bit of a spotlight in a way that I don't think she's done for a while because I do think that in a lot of previous books Anne Rice's secondary characters weren't up to scratch but in this book I think they're all really great. If, like me, you've got to this point in the Vampire Chronicles series or just before this book and you're starting to lose steam, definitely pick this one up and give it a go because I think you'll be, you'll be quite shocked by how, how great this one is. That's not to say that like, the other ones were bad or anything, although I do think that the Tales of the New Vampires were not the best, but you know, I, I think this one is a big step up from the previous few books in the series and I'm hoping that the ones that follow manage to maintain that standard. I've heard good things about Blackwood Farm, I've heard less good things about Blood Canticle, so we'll see how we go with those books moving forward. 
In any case, I'm really looking forward to picking this series up, and I don't think it will be so long before I do the next review for The Vampire Chronicles. Alright, that's it for this video. Let me know what you think of Blood and Gold in the comments. As always, I look forward to discussing that with you down there. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I'm back making regular videos now after my little break, so I'll see you all in the next video next week. Ta-ra!